Welcome to episode 8 of the Speed Secrets Podcast with today's guest, David Ray. The topics today are how to get the most out of an HPDE or track day event, along with David's most popular driving tips. Welcome to the Speed Secrets Podcast. Join Ross Bentley and guests, drivers, instructors, and coaches, engineers, officials, and others for conversations about high performance and race driving. Listen for tips and advice, thought-provoking ideas, and inspiration to take your own driving to the next level. Green, green, green! Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, Today, I'm talking with David Ray, who... I think, David, you're the only guy that I know who's busier than I am. So uh, I'm glad that you could squeeze us into your schedule here. And uh, oh, and by the way, uh, founder and owner of Hooked on Driving. So thanks for joining us, David. Welcome to the show. Uh, Pleased to be here. Thanks for having me, Ross. Yeah, and I want to jump straight in and I I want to talk about what you and I see when drivers show up for an HPDE event, a high-performance driver education event or a track day event. And you know, more specifically, what someone listening to the show can can gain from that experience, you know, what can they use themselves? So those are the kind of things I kind of want to talk about is, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what are some of the things that we see and others can learn from? Um, but first, I mean, Hooked on Driving, you're, you're, you're the only national provider of HPD events all across the country, correct? Well, that's true from the standpoint of a, a, a private operation, yes. Yeah, I mean, other than the car clubs, the car clubs, obviously, but as a private professional operation, um, you guys put on events all over the country. That's got to be a lot of events. How many, how many events in a year does Hooked on Driving well, we do? Just, we just expanded with a, a merger with a group in Florida, so I think we're up around 130, 135 days on track this year, which is it's uh, pretty crazy. And I and I will say, while we're, while we're national, we certainly cover up and down the coast, which uh, permeates into the mainland. We're still looking at Texas and uh, some of the, like the Rocky Mountain states, even though guys from those states come out and see us on both coasts. So, yeah. So you've seen a lot of drivers come through and and you've been doing this for, what is it, a decade or more? Uh, Yeah, we we started HOD uh, in 2004. Okay, okay. So you've seen a few mistakes along the way. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see drivers make when they come to their, I'm not going to say maybe their first event, but maybe it's, you know, they've been doing it for a while and, and they're still making some of those mistakes. What are some of the, yeah, what are some of the mistakes that you see people make? Well, you know, I think, first of all, the demographic of those that are listening to this probably don't fall into this category because they are paying attention and digging in and they've found your websites and stuff and they're doing their homework. But I think the number one issue is folks not prepared and that that can be in a number of forms, either uh, not really doing their homework on their car, having uh, discoveries on their car at the last minute, finding out that they brought their motocross helmet that got mud on it that's not going to be approved for use. Uh, They've got, you know, they forgot to gas up the car on the way out to the track, or they had a big party the night before and they're showing up late. Uh, So, you know, I think the number one, uh, the one message that uh, that we want to send out is we HOD really does a fair amount of orientation on our website and in logistics messages. Read the messages, pay attention to the rules, look at the schedule, think ahead, be early, be prepared. So that I mean, it's pretty fundamental, but it really makes a big difference because you don't want to be scrambling around nervous at the last minute. Oh, I forgot to get the golf clubs out of the trunk. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And obviously that applies to your events, but, you know, the car club events and everything else that goes on. I mean, the cool thing about this sport is there's something happening almost everywhere every weekend, right? Uh, there's just so many of these driving events on track. It's it's really cool that this sport happens like this. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, one of the things that if you're on time, if you come a little early, you get, you know, you get through the line quickly and you end up a little bit of time on your hands, you could actually kind of walk around and see who's going to be on the track with you and meet a few people and get a little sense of, you know, what the feel of the event is and the personalities that you're going to be dealing with. And, and also, you know, our events tend to be pretty good car shows. (laughs) We get some fun toys out there. So it's kind of good to have enough time to kind of settle in, maybe have a little breakfast and, and be ready for the driver's meeting. 
I guess, you know, the social part of it is, uh, I mean, anybody listening to this, they, they know that's a big part of why they do what they do. You know, you go to the track and, it, you know, it's just cool hanging out with other car people and, you know, specifically driving people. I mean, we can go to a cars and coffee and look at cars all day long, but, uh, and, and nothing wrong with that. But this is all about driving. Like it's at the track and you're driving. So um, that's the cool part. I, I keep thinking that, you know, one of the things about our sport that's so cool is just how accessible it is. I've said it before. I'll say it again is, you know, if you're a tennis player, you can't go and play at center court at Wimbledon. You know, <laughs> if you're a football fan, you can't go and play in the stadium of your favorite football team. But if you're a car guy, you're a driving guy, a racing guy, or whatever, you can go to Laguna Seca. You can go to Road Atlanta. You can go to these places and play in the same places that you're that the big boys do. So um, I, I just think the sport is so accessible that way, and more so than any other sport. Oh, agreed. I mean, we're kind of maybe in the same boat with uh, golf, although you know uh, maybe I can go play sawgrass, but that course just ate me alive. And <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can I can teach myself Road Atlanta one turn at a time, and uh, nobody's watching. So it's it's a pretty special opportunity to be on those tracks for sure. I mean, we're all over the place with these iconic tracks. It's uh, it's you know, folks. I mean, you talk to folks that you try to explain what we do, and they don't believe you sometimes. They get no, you're not driving at Sonoma Raceway or Sebring or you know, Watkins Glen. It's it's a pretty cool thing. Actually, you mentioned golf, and I, I love that. Uh, I love that saying that you know both golf and performance race driving, whatever track driving, uh, they're both very very mental sports. You know, they're they're similar in that way. And uh, you know, the only difference is in golf you have too much time to think, and in driving a track you don't have enough time to think. So that's that's the similarities I think. So, um, yep. so. Uh, let, let's flip that around. I mean, the drivers that do the best job, the drivers that have the most fun, that learn the most, I mean, what do they do? What do they do differently? And I guess you could just say they, they're better prepared, but what are some of the other things that you see? Yeah, so I, I think overall, I think folks that are really thoughtful about what we're doing and ponder a bit what their goal is, um, there probably is a temptation for a lot of folks to come to the track. And, you know, we call the business hooked on driving for a reason because our customers actually told us, yeah, Dave, man, I'm hooked on this. I go, okay, well, well, that'll be the name. Um, but they, they, uh, sometimes it's easy to fall in deep and start like get the credit card out and go crazy and put the supercharger on and figure out how to get by that guy in the blue Mustang and uh, do a lot of car improvements and uh, jump all in uh, rather than kind of sit back and say, wait a minute, this is this is a potential hobby for me, kind of like golf or horseback riding or tennis or something. Let's take a more organized approach to developing some skills and work on the driver first. Um, now, there may be some minor modifications that need to be made to a car to, to move on up the ladder from the beginner to the intermediate group, but develop a plan of where, you know, and talk to the other drivers and the other run groups as to what their experiences are, what they're doing, and watch what's going on out there in the other run groups and decide, yeah, you know what, I'm not ready for the, the Delta group out there running with open passing, but man, the B group looks like they're having a lot more fun. They're going a little quicker and they don't have those beginners slowing them down. So I want to move there. What does it take? Uh, and, and be thoughtful about that. Share that. If you've got coaching, uh, share that with the coaching um, that you've, uh, you know, you're experiencing and uh, take it one step at a time. Uh, you know, skills, skills development and uh, the development of the car. I, I do see a lot of guys jump in too hard and uh, burn themselves out, either that or <clears throat> uh, create some bad politics at home by dropping a quick 10K on a car or something or that kind of thing. And so um, I think I, I hope I'm getting to your question that, um, you know, work on, uh, you know, every driver as they get in the car we find, you know, there's six or eight kind of common soft spots in the skill development. Somebody has an instinct to turn in early or somebody's tossing the car around thinking they're fast. Maybe they're coming over from autocrossing and they're 
really want to pitch the car a lot and that's hard to do in road racing safely or um, somebody being too timid in traffic. Um, pick those items and work on them uh, to develop their skills. You know, we found it's really kind of, I don't know if this is <laughs> whatever, you can edit this out if it's, if it's inappropriate, but we find that successful people come in and they may or may not be very talented drivers to start with, but if they really like it, they like the community, they enjoy driving, they enjoy their car, the track, the people, they, I watch them decide, okay, I'm going to figure out how to do this, and I'm going to progressively succeed at this. Now, they may never drive in an SCCA or NASA race or that kind of competition level, but they're going to get competent and get to a level where they're safe, they're fairly quick, they're predictable on the track, they're having fun, and they've just exhibited the same success habits that they've done in their personal lives and their business lives. It's funny you say that. Um you know, like you, I've seen so many, so many people that, you know, they took up the sport a little bit later in life. You know, they, they're not the, they're not the Max Verstappens, you know, they're not uh, driving Formula One as a teenager. You know, they took up the sport in their thirties, forties, even fifties, even sixties or whatever. Um, and they were really, really successful at what they did and or what they do in their professional life. And they come in there and they go, well, this is just driving, <laughs> you know, I do it every day. How difficult can it be? And then they get on the track and they don't pick it up immediately. And some do get frustrated. I, I you know, I've seen some get so frustrated that they go, I'm going to go take up golf. Uh, you know, so they go off and do something else. And I think, you, you know, your point is, is, you know, come in with a little bit of a, uh, you know, be prepared, but be prepared to learn because they're, you know, it is different than driving on the, on the street. And uh, understand that it's going to take time. You know, I, I remember a number of years ago um, working with a, a fellow novice driver at an HPD event. And, uh, you know, he was just like, well, I just don't understand. Why is this not working? Why have I not got this perfected in the first 15 minutes? And I go, what do you do in your what do you do in your professional life? And well, I'm a surgeon. I go, well. You know, did you did you do brain surgery in fi in the first fifteen minutes? Did you master that? And he's like, well, no. But so I said, well, this is not that different. So um, interesting. So you you know, obviously, it's the preparation you're talking about, but it's also coming in with the attitude of, I got to, I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to get better. Right. Well, you know, I, I'm going to throw in that. Uh, I think there can be a discovery by drivers. It, this is hard to explain to people. You know, it's like, well, how fast do you go? Well, I do. I've done that on Highway 80, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So they show up and they don't know exactly what to expect. Um, one of the things that I, I really would like to send a message out on, and, and that is this is not um, an experience, a bucket list thing to go do a day and get maximum fun and just haul ass on that one day and go home and brag about, yeah, I got to 95 on the straightaway. It was pretty cool, but they made me slow down. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it is, it's, it's not a one-time thing. I, there's a per, you know, there's probably a certain percentage that are going to be like, yeah, I got to drive Sonoma or Sebring and I'm, I'm, I'm happy now, but it really is just the first step. It, you're hitting a bucket of balls and you're spraying the balls into the woods, uh, you, you got to get you got to slow down that backswing and uh, and stay with it. So you, you touched on earlier around, uh, you know, the pulling the credit card out and, and uh, burning the credit card down, buying stuff for your car, you know, the go faster stuff. And, you know, I think, you know, obviously we be in full agreement that that's not the place to, to start. The place to start is to, like you said, to, you know, work on that that spacer in between the steering wheel and the back of the seat uh, called the driver work on that first. And uh, uh, when it comes to car prep though, you know, there are some basic things that are good to do some, you know, that are safety and reliability focused as opposed to go fast focus. Right. Yep. Oh, absolutely. I mean, by the, and I'll, I'll do a plug with Steve Dynan helped us do a kind of a walk around video, like a four minute segment on how to do a tech inspection of your car. It's on our hooked on driving dot com site under first timers. But anyway, yeah, I mean, the fundamentals, um, I, you know, the, I think there's kind of two sides to this. If you just picked up your new Boxster S about three weeks ago, <laughs> there's not a whole lot to do. Just empty the car out, put gas in. 
But, you know, if you've been using your car, uh, all the fluid should be topped off. Uh, we recommend that the air pressure and the tires should probably be set to start with um, at the manufacturer's recommendation. So the tires functioning, maybe a pound over, but, you know, we're not going to go that fast initially. So just be sure they're proper uh, per the, the recommendations in the door jam. Um, full tank of gas. You know, we have most most organizations have rental helmets for our type of program. I would say I'm not really proud of our rental helmets. They're rental helmets. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, maybe one day if you want to just check us out, that's great. Rent for 25 bucks or 35, whatever it is at the certain track and uh, that deal. But if you think you might want to do this, I'd recommend buying a nice quality helmet. Uh, it is a personal thing. It fits right. It's uh I'd go spend a little dough on it, get the lighter weight, better helmet that fits well. Uh, but um, And then if you can get on the Internet, um, uh, we've got videos of a lot of the tracks we're at on our site, but certainly you can YouTube videos of uh, laps on the track that you're going to. You can eliminate the fear of the unknown. You may or may not be being taught by someone that's qualified. You might find Bob in his, uh, you know, his... Uh, Whatever. I won't throw any car under the bus here. <laughs> but, you know, don't necessarily rely on stuff you find on YouTube other than just the visuals of what the track looks like. There's blind turns usually and you can see what traffic looks like, how to get on and off the track, those kinds of things. That all just eliminates the fear of the unknown and gets you to be able to relax sooner. And, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, I go to a lot of these events and I hear people talking about the racing line around the track. And then there's the school line around the track. And, you know, I guess, well, first of all, I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, the racing line versus the school line and what do you teach and how, and why? Well, the first thing we want to do is we'll use a school line, but we don't go straight to that. We've actually had kind of an epiphany in our organization over the last few years. We want to teach a driver to be safe in traffic, smooth, conscious of mirrors, uh, conscious of flag stations, um, really flowing the car uh, with, without, uh, it, without kind of surprises for a coach before we even teach any line. Um, and that, we've found some coaches, you know, they, if they don't really know how to coach, they'll gravitate to trying to teach someone the line on their second lap. And that driver still doesn't even remember where turn nine goes. Is it, am I going left or right up here? Hey, you know, right. <laughs> it's like, and so it becomes a mechanical thing rather than an intuitive thing. Uh, that's you know. So uh, we, we want to smooth them out. We want to get them comfortable. Then we start getting to the edge and the outside, inside, outside, and and I think this the line that we're teaching. And this is you know I'll I'll throw a tip over to the coaches or instructors that are working with us, and that is. Your line may be the best for your skill set and your car, but what we do is try to get a benchmark line that everyone learns, everybody teaches consistently. We can follow and see what it looks like if someone uh, is ahead of us on the line. That's a good thing. That car showing us how to do it. And it is really probably the safest, smoothest line, most efficient line around the track because we're that line has to work for a 7 Series BMW and a Spec Miata and a Spec Racer Ford, and a uh, Porsche Cup car, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those, you know, if I've got camber plates and sticky tires, my line into turn two may be very different than a Subaru that understeers a lot. So we've kind of tried to adapt that and come up with a consistent line to, 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 to learn and, and nail down, you know, consistently. That, and so that is a huge thing. Basically, also... We're, that's a real kind of a, uh, I think, a barometer or almost a limiter on pace because we want to see that line consistent. If the driver can drive that line consistently, then we can add pace, we can add throttle, we can go a little deeper, and we might be able to play around a little bit with a little earlier turn in or a little double apex occasionally. But, you know, so for, for drivers that are coming in, and, and I just love it, I, um, th I think the other big point that I got to add is at five or six or seven tenths, your car can do any line. Right. So we do often get resistance to the line. Well, well, I can go right down the middle of this. Why do I have to go over to that all the way out to that edge? 
Well, then that's why we do demo laps before lunch to show them at an eight or nine tenths pace why the line is the line is because it has to be the line as you start using centrifugal force and adding pace. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, you know, probably you go to you go to any track in the country and you know, the, the thing that you hear talked about more than anything else is the line, you know, it's like there's some magical thing. And, you know, it's, it's, there isn't just a line, there are lines that you drive. And, uh, you know, I've often said that, you know, I think often we get too caught up sometimes in the line. You know, I, I, I see, you know, I understand with, with new drivers, you've got to kind of, you, you've got to kind of have them follow a line or help them learn a line. And in that process, they learn why they drive the line. I think that's the very most important thing, right? It's, I guess, first of all, it's, can you consistently drive it? But more importantly, it's, why do you drive that line? Why is, why that line as opposed to right. have the car in the middle of the track? And if they can start to understand that, and, you know, I always say, drive the car, not the track. And, you know, because I think sometimes we get so caught up in the, I got to be at this point on the track and at this point on the track that we forget that we're actually driving the car. And when you start to drive the car and you go, oh, that's what it feels like. Oh, the car wants to go over here. So I think that's a, it's a big aha moment for a lot of drivers. Well, and one of the things also that I think you can add in there, obviously the seat of the pants, you, you hope the new driver kind of starts feeling it. But there's also a, a, an additional element you can add, and that is visual references. And I, we'll talk about early on um, where what you're seeing as you come off an apex. Are, are you looking at a wall or a hay bale, <laughs> or are you looking at a track? And so um, sometimes the visuals come before the seat of the pants because you know you you, you have to flow the car pretty hard to have to get to a track out point. Uh, but you can drive slowly and point out, look, see, we're looking down the straightaway here. This isn't this cool, you know, instead of over here and adding steering at the last minute. Yeah, and I'm, uh, you know, a big proponent of a big part of your job is to soak up reference points, you know, and you begin with all the visual things. So, you know, there's a crack in a pavement there. There's a curb there. There's a tree off in the distance. I line the car up with those kinds of things. But eventually you start to go, oh, and there's a bump there too. I turn in at the bump, you know, um, and I can hear a difference in the sound of the tires that goes across this surface here to that. And that tells me I'm in the right place or the wrong place. But, uh, it, you know, I always think it's interesting because I ask this question a lot is, you know, I'll be at the track and I'll say, why do you drive the line that you drive? And, you know, you kind of often get this like, you know, the face looking back at me kind of like, well, duh, you know, like, and then they got to go, well, because that's where somebody told me to drive. <laughs> and, and, you know, I kind of go, well, who told that person? Well, somebody told that person. And that, you know, so uh, I think at a, there comes a point in time where most drivers get that aha moment where they go, now I know why I want to drive that line because that's what the car is telling me. That's the car is telling me to be there. And I think that's, that's one of those magical moments that it's why we do what we do. Right. Uh, you know, we go to the track to see the, the, the light bulb go on, the eyes start to light up and everything. Cause when they get that aha moment, it's like, that's the magic part. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe another way to say it, if, if I'm, put on the spot and say, why, why is the line the line? I'm trying to straighten out a circuitous course ah. as much as I can. You know, I'm trying to take the turns out of the turns. And then there's, ob there's also the, this is really a series of drag races with controlled panic stops in between. <laughs> so you got to get, get stopped as quickly as you can and get back on the gas as soon as you can. And you got to find the line that allows you to do that. And going back to that, you know, school line versus racing line. I mean, you know, a lot of times people say, well, the racing line is simply, it's a defensive line. And, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, you know, a lot of people go, well, the racing line, you tend to turn in a little earlier. You tend to hug the inside a little bit to, to block people. I was like, actually, when I'm racing, I want to drive the fastest line. Yes, there comes a time where you yes. position the car to discourage somebody to pass you. But the best way to discourage somebody to pass you is to drive faster than they do. Yeah. So drive the line that's just the fastest. And often you know that's it's it's not that different it's not like some big you know the opposite side of the track from the racing from the school line right the school right. line is meant to be the quickest line usually with a little bit of 
margin built in for it, maybe a slightly later apex or something that just allows a little bit more margin for error. But, uh, you know, drive the, the line that results in the quickest time to go from A to B, from start line to finish line, right? Yeah, I know a lot of the drivers as they develop their skills start looking at their own lap times. We don't do timing at HOD. We're non-competitive, but uh, that that is a reality. But the thing that I don't think is appropriate is to think of a race line and defensive lines at an HPDE. I mean, <laughs> that's like counter. Like, wait a minute, guys, you're at the wrong event uh, if you're trying to block a car uh, or practice blocking cars. Uh, and you know, I think to your point. I agree. Uh, the fastest line is the fastest line, and that's the best way to keep a lead if you were competing. I will say, I'll confess, because I've done a fair amount of racing myself as an amateur over the years, but there's the qualifying line, which is the pristine line if you absolutely have won that magic open lap with no traffic, uh, but then then also just the, the ability to be consistent uh, and... Uh, uh, the the well uh, true confession I do have a line for the last three laps of the race if somebody's <laughs> right on my back that's a different line. <laughs> right 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 so and you bring up the point of you know you race and and then you come back to your events where you're teaching in a non competitive environment how do you make that change is that a is that a physical thing like is it a physical you know the techniques change or is it simply a mindset thing or Maybe it's not simply, but it's a mindset thing. How do you make that change? It's a really good question, and I actually didn't do well. I actually came to HPDE from racing after 20 years, and initially I, I, I'm not sure I really thought it through fairly uh, well because I caught myself chasing people all over the place. I'm like, well, I'll just – this is a different environment for competition, right? It's really just not – there's no checkered flag. <laughs> And then I realized, wait a minute, and I was doing demo laps, and my, my illustration, I wrote an article about this a few years ago, that uh, at Thunderhill, for those that are familiar with Thunderhill, turn eight is a real fast kink with very little banking, and it's a pucker if you're a fairly fast, uh, if you're in a fairly quick car, it's a, it's, it's a goal to try to go through there flat out if you're at full 10 tenths. And I had just come off a race weekend at Thunder Hill, and I was I puckered and I got flat out through there a few times, but not always, and scared myself a couple times. And then, like two weeks later, I'm at the track doing a demo lap, and I realize I'm lifting and having fun. <laughs> it's like, hey, it's really pretty cool if you just go through nine tenths, uh, take a little bit of edge off, take the pucker factor out of it. That's a lot of fun. So it is the difference between, for me, it was an aha moment. that you, you, it's, it's two different kinds of fun. I really do enjoy competition and chasing cars. But when I let that go and realized, wow, you know, I, okay, I'm in my little Mustang demo car here, and here comes one of my students in a McLaren with 600 horsepower. I'm going to let him by, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and it's okay. And I wave at him on the way by, you know, it's a whole different thing. So I hope I'm addressing your, your question that I'm out there to have a good time, be safe, drive well, and, and share what we do. I, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, there are people that kind of look at, you know, what happens in HPDE track day events where people are just, you know, they're just out having fun and they're, you know, supposedly different than people that go racing. And I, I, I don't think there's any, I don't think one's any better than the other. You know, I, I think to your point is you can have just as much fun not racing wheel to wheel as you can racing wheel to wheel. Now, personally, again, you know, I'm like you, I come from the racing background and you know, I, I love that wheel to wheel, the strategy, the thinking, all that kind of stuff. I love that whole part of it. But, uh, you know, I can have as much fun just nailing that beautiful lap driven at eight tenths. You know, yeah. um, to me, the biggest thing is, is if if I've made the decision that I'm going to go to the track and I'm going to drive at eight tenths, then I want to drive consistently at eight tenths. Okay. If I if I find myself, you know, I'm at six or seven tenths there and I'm at ten tenths over here. Well, the average out to eight tenths, but that's not what my goal is. My goal is to drive eight tenths all the time. So I, I think that's part of the, the challenge. And, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the why do people do this? You know, I think it's that that chasing, maybe not chasing somebody a car in front to try to pass them. It's chasing 
what feels like or is as close to the perfect lap as possible. And uh, if somebody says they got they've driven the perfect lap, boy, I sure like to meet them. Because, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, and I, I mean, at, at a at a different level, I, you know, I, we've just finished a real successful season with HOD, and I, one there was one day we ended up a little short on coaches, so I took a father and his two sons, and we normally do one on one or two on one coaching. I did three on one that day with some radios and did lead and follow. And then got in and out of the cars, um, and to watch what happened, that they were they were all three a little feisty to start with. They had good cars. Uh, actually, Dad ca- kind of came with a weapon. He had an M3 with some some prep on it. And the two guys, one of the sons got it right away. The other son didn't get it right away. Um, we worked a little extra with the other son, and by the end of the day, we were able to sign all three of them off, and they could go out and run together on their own safely. And I watched them literally have a lifetime experience. I mean, this was a family epiphany. Uh, Dad was just beaming, and and the son, who had maybe not been the better athlete, did well and got up to the same standard of the other son because they're what we weren't having a race. You know, yeah. they were all able to run together, and that was the goal. And so, no, it, it, there's magic that happens out there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, this is this is a tough question just to pull an answer out of the top of your head here. But, uh, you know, what's the one driving skill or technique that you most often see drivers either neglect or struggle with the most? Who? yeah, Um you know, it's it's tough to put it as just one, but uh, yeah, you know, believe I'm, me, I'll pull it out of my head, not, yeah. not as, <laughs> as opposed to somewhere else. But anyway, um, I would probably say patience at the entry of a turn. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's probably three or four of these that would all be valid, but the the you know there's an instinct for folks as they approach a turn when they see the turn begin they want to have the wheel turned and it is an instinct maybe a oh i just a wild guess maybe a third to a half of the folks we have don't get the idea of going beyond and doing a little potentially asymmetrical turn it doesn't make sense or the patience just to get to that point that will allow them to exit properly it is not necessarily a natural instinct. So um, I I think that's where maybe the coach really needs to kind of just stay with the clear communication, simple language uh, to have them wait, wait, wait now. And and then have that kind of work into a habit and have that seat of the pants and visual come around for the driver. Um, I I think if if we can solve that problem, I think I would probably also say the folks that have that instinct to turn in early may also be the slightly more aggressive ones, the ones wanting to get on it quick and, and want, you know, like, I'm going to I'm going to win this school. I'm going to be the fastest person in this class second session out, you know. And so uh, it, it is a matter of uh, a coach convincing folks to trust them and uh, and wait, um, you know, the, you know, smoothness. Uh, uh, smoothness is another huge uh, step uh, in the right direction. I think some folks are uh, will go out, especially, I'll throw in this, the cars that now have the F1 gearboxes, the, the uh, paddle shifts, um, I think we have to be real careful with those those cars t- to be compression. I mean, it's it's so cool to blip the throttle on the entry of a turn. Oh, wow, 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 you know. And so let's let's smooth that out and and drive the car without so many gear changes, so that we can actually flow the car and then worry about getting the car in the right gear at the right place. Uh, so there's another another step. People get too busy with with gearboxes and stuff too early. So what you're saying is the people that like driving fast around a racetrack are not the most patient people in the world? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> I'm shocked to realize that now yeah. that you point that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coming from, uh, you know, if I if I look out there and go, okay, who's who's more impatient than me? Maybe maybe David? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, the message there is be patient. And, and I, you know, I think the other one is that you just talked about is do less. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, yes. you don't need to be, 
your hands <laughs> flailing around and making gear changes all over the place. You know, I think one of the best um, exercises I think a, a driver can do a lot of times is stick the car in fourth gear and drive around the track in one gear. Right. right. Just take take the shifting thing out of it, work on everything else. And actually what ends up happening a lot of times is that corner that you, you know, you go down to second gear and then you, you know, catch third gear halfway through the corner and fourth gear on the exit, you realize, well, I can do this in third gear or maybe even fourth gear. You just roll a little bit of speed and flow, as you said. So um, those are those are really good points. So thanks for that. Um, um, so uh, unfortunately, I want to kind of wrap this up. Uh, you, I know you and I could talk all day about driving, but uh, uh, kind of want to wrap this up. And, uh, you know, I'll put in the show notes, I'll put a link to the Hooked on Driving website. Is there anything else that uh, you want to share with listeners before we wrap this up? Uh, you know what? I, I uh, No, I'll, I'll say thank you for our relationship, Ross. You're doing uh, quite a bit of work with Hooked on Driving and going to be at a number of our events this year. And we're really proud of that relationship. And thank you for having me. Great, great. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Some of the most fun things I did all of last year were at those events, those advanced uh, coaching sessions that we did together at uh, at your events. They were they were just an absolute blast for me. And I know the drivers got a lot of it. So looking forward to more of those. Uh, thanks, David. I'm going to see you at a track sometime soon. I know that. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, I know that we're going to be at a track uh, sometime very soon. So thanks. I look forward March, to that. Yeah, March 4th and 5th at Auto Club Speedway Roval. Well, well there we go. That's where I'm going to be. Um Okay, so thanks, David. Thanks for being on the show, and uh, we'll see you out there. As always, keep having fun. Okay, here's today's tip, today's speed secret. The most important corner is not the one leading onto the longest straight. It's the fastest corner. You know, the most important corner, the one leading onto the longest straight, that uh, piece of advice, I think it's a bit outdated. Now, I'm not saying the corner leading onto a straight is not important. It is. But think about this. Which corner do most drivers find the most challenging? Right, the real fast ones. And they're usually not the one leading onto a long straight. But if you master that fast corner, you'll be better than everybody else. Plus, if you focus on it, you'll be fast through it sooner. And think about this too. If you make a mistake in a slow corner that leads onto a straight, let's say one that you take in second gear, how difficult is it to make up for that error? Not too difficult. Just get on the throttle and reaccelerate. But if you make the same kind of error in a fast corner, one that you take in fourth gear, well, how difficult is it to regain your speed then? It's more difficult because your car doesn't accelerate as quickly in fourth gear as it does in second. And that's another reason why you should focus on learning the fast corners first, especially one that has some amount of straight after it. As always, go to my website at speedsecrets.com for more tips, advice, and resources, and even more free stuff. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast and for sharing it with other people. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Keep learning and having fun. See you next time.